that we had such a we had such an interesting and exciting day yesterday that culminated in a sort of celebration for the conference organizers at my house last night and i think um, some of us celebrated too hard because the our colleague who was supposed to open the conference this morning is is MIA um, i think that's that's I, I consider that a sign of great success um, uh, so i'd like I'd like to uh, do a little impromptu welcome to all of you uh, and good morning. Uh, <laughs> thank you for coming to the second day of our conference um, on uh, controlling sexuality through violent shame and cultural oppression. Um, today we have two panels um, separated by, do we have a break for lunch in the middle or is? <laughs> no, today we have two panels back to back with a short break between them. Um, and uh, this morning's panel is entitled um, State Tolerance of Violence and Discrimination. And without further ado, I will introduce you to uh, Erica George from the law school. And that gracious introduction was provided by David Heidner of the psychology department. So thank you, David. Um, good morning. I wanted to thank you all for attending um, and to thank the Tanners for their continued support of the Human Rights Center. Um, as well as the organizers for putting together such a spectacular program. I also wanted to acknowledge my students from constitutional law who will be coming in and unfortunately out since they have other classes to attend. Um, and to thank the panelists and presenters and all of you for participating in what I hope will be um, a very fruitful and enlightening and inspiring discussion. So um, as David mentioned, this is the third panel of four and state tolerance of violence and discrimination is our general topic. Um, gathered here to explore really important issues, we have two um, lawyers and an academic historian. And the panel is really going to explore um, questions of how the state shapes preferences and, and what's tolerated and what's not tolerated. Um, the state is conceived as what is the entity that has a monopoly over violence. Um, and the principal instruments of violence are generally the military and the police force. But I must submit to you that law also has a role in shaping um, what we tolerate as violence and who violence is directed against. Um, and by violence, I mean something broader than simply interpersonal physical harm, but rather the kinds of force that can constrain choices and shape choices. So um, the law has a role of doing that. Um, violence can be either physical or verbal, force against self or other, or sometimes even internally directed. And so the, our conversations today will touch on a number of themes, um, particularly discrimination and how law can reinforce and reify um, what preferences are, what choices are, and what we tolerate as a society, or how it may revolutionize what we understand as what's tolerable um, and the ways that we live and shape our private lives as they're reinforced by state power. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker and we'll go in the order that's on the program, which is also the orders that the um, speakers are seated in. First, we have Professor Beth Clements from the Department of History at the University of Utah. Beth's current work is titled, We Are Family. No, <laughs> I love Sister Sledge. Um, and she will, in that book, which will be her third, I believe, will focus on gay relationships to the family and family understandings of gays and relationships in post-war America. Um, Beth comes to us from earning her BA in History and Women's Studies at Columbia University in New York City. She went on to the University of Pennsylvania, earning her master's and her PhD in history and a graduate certificate in women's studies. Her previous books include Love for Sale, Courting Couples, Charity Girls and Sex Workers in the Modern Making of Modern Heterosexuality in New York City, 1900 to 1945. That book focuses on American understandings of the relationship between sexual activity and morality and how those have changed over time. Um, in 2001, she, the project won a Dixon Ryan Fox Prize Award for the best manuscript in history on the state of New York. Professor Clements has also authored several reviews and three articles, including Prostitution, written for the, for the Palgrave um, Guide to History of Sexuality in the Modern West, and From Sociability to Spectacle, Interracial Sexuality and the Ideological Uses of Space in New York City. Um, so as you can see, Professor Clements' work does a lot to discuss um, what it is we tolerate in our society, and I think she'll enlighten us further about um, 
maybe violence of or against the self in certain communities. So. Or do you want me up there? Podium, podium. All right. I'm so terribly tractable. Um, okay. In the early 1970s, both the, uh, as both the gay and lesbian, and as well as the feminist movement began organizing, many women who had previously been in relationships with men came out, and some of these women had children. When evaluating the records from these early years, I found that both the state in the form of the family court system and the lesbian community defined lesbians in ways that, or lesbianism in ways that excluded motherhood. For courts, parenting became a way to shore up patriarchal family structure and produce heterosexual children. Um, even in the face of blatantly sexist and homophobic rulings, however, the lesbian community itself also expressed ambivalence about making room for mothering as a component of lesbian identity. While opposed to the court's uh, actions as patriarchal violations of women's rights, lesbian feminists provided only half-hearted support for the mothers and children in their midst in the early 1970s. Now, it's not surprising to me that the family court system, largely unexposed to either feminism or lesbianism, and at least initially extremely hostile to both, would support a patriarchal vision of the family. Just not really surprising. In custody cases involving lesbian mothers, the court supported the right of the father to his children, even if he had been physically or sexually abusive. In one case, a family court judge in Mississippi, I feel like using evidence from Mississippi is just a cheap shot, <laughs> but in Mississippi in 1978, gave custody to a child who had, quote, beaten both Nancy, the mother, and the child, and once broken Nancy's jaw. In another case in 1982, the judge placed children with their father, even though, quote, the children had been physical and sexually abused by their, by their father. As the mother in the case reported, the guardian ad litem for the children still recommended that she retain custody. So the children's representative said the kids should stay with the mother, quote, although he thought my lifestyle was sick, unquote. Going against this recommendation of the child's best interest, the judge upheld the father's custody. When placing children with their father became absolutely untenable, uh, judges gave the children either to other family members or into state custody. In a particularly nasty case in 1975, a lesbian couple's home was, quote, burned down during the trial. After being placed with their father, quote, the two younger daughters have run away four times to be with their mother. Rather than allow them to stay, the judge placed them, quote, in the juvenile detention center in Tacoma, Washington, where neither parent may see them for three months, unquote. In another case, quote, the court appointed a psychologist who testified that Jackie should get the children if Barbara moved out, but if not, the girl should be placed in a foster home. The assumption judges made about the problems of lesbian parents and their impact on children's sexuality led judges to choose state foster care systems as the best alternative for children when placing with fathers literally threatened children's physical well-being. The courts displayed a combination of motives for these choices, ranging from the desire to punish, quote, selfish mothers who were more interested in sexuality and their, in, than in their children, to a commitment to ensuring heterosexuality in the children who were involved. As one judge stated in an Ohio case in 1975, quote, I think for the sake of the children, a lesbian should abandon the practice. Orgasm means more to them than children or anything else, unquote. Courts that did rule in favor of women's custody routinely required that lesbian women not live with their lovers uh, or allow actually any contact with any gay people, gay culture, or gay political activity. In this vision, women had no right to express or even have sexual desires outside of sec heterosexual marriage or really have any freedom of assembly or freedom of association. These decisions also defined a family as private space, one that could not be combined with either non-marital sexuality or, interestingly enough, in the, late, in the late 60s and early 70s, politics. Judges also feared that lesbian parenting would result in homosexual children and seemed particularly concerned about the sexuality and gender performance of boy children. So girls, they're a little bit easier on. The right to parent became a way for the state to exercise control over the sexuality of both women and children and to preserve the rights of fathers as superior to those of any other member of the family. 
In fact, in one case, the judge actually insisted that the mother and her lover, quote, be required at all times to refer to, El Wattar, uh, to Mr. El Wattar as father, daddy, or dad. This ruling did not hold up on appeal, although it nicely communicates the ways that the court infantilized women and positioned men as surrogate fathers for the entire family, sort of requiring that the lover, the mother, and the children refer the father as daddy uh, in open court. While judges' commitments to fathers' rights remain strong, the court seemed uninterested in holding men responsible for any financial burdens assumed in parenting. Fathers often used accusations of lesbianism as a way to deny paying child support. Judges refused to enforce child support rulings when sexuality was involved, uh, or when women's sexuality was involved, and on occasion actually suggested that women give up child support in exchange for custody of their children. One particularly egregious case in Michigan, uh, the judge told the mother that she could, quote, have her daughter back without child support if she would then relinquish custody of her son, unquote. That all of these decisions were made in the best interest of the child does beg the question, since when is poverty good for children? The kind of patriarchy advocated by judges in these decisions seems out of step with the definition of patriarchy more common, uh, more familiar in English common law, namely one that gives men power, but that also holds them legally and economically responsible for their children and wives. In custody cases, the judges in the 1970s acted to support patriarchal family structures. However, in decisions about child support, judges seem to be shoring up masculine choice more than patriarchy itself or patriarchy, patriarchal family. That is to say, a masculine choice to be responsible or irresponsible in family commitments. Or to put it another way, perhaps the courts, at least in the realm of child support, were more interested in protecting a perceived embattled masculinity of the 1970s, one that's embattled by feminism, by gay liberation, by the Vietnam War, uh, rather than enacting in the child's best interest. So they basically are acting to allow men to be financially irresponsible and to make a choice about whether or not they actually want to s provide economic support for the children that they fathered. It may also have been that they, like male, uh, their male plaintiffs, sought to punish women, and ch withdrawing child support was one of the ways to do this. When they did not deny custody outright, some judges did refuse much needed financial support as a way of punishing disorderly women and their children and disavowing the rights of non-traditional families to traditional forms of support. And an interesting side note, many judges also made a condition of women receiving custody that they not apply for welfare. Um, so they're denying uh, financial support in terms of child support, but they're also arguing that the state should not have to provide child support in these cases. What was surprising to me in the documents that I was looking at was that many women in the lesbian community seemed to share judges' vision that lesbianism and motherhood were mutually exclusive. Please keep in mind that unlike court decisions, these positions on lesbianism and motherhood emerge out of debates uh, within the community itself. So obviously they're not legally binding, as custody cases are. And they also involve women staking out many different kinds of claims about who lesbians were and who was welcome in the community. Some women did defend the rights of lesbian mothers, although the very existence of these debates exposes broader assumptions that most lesbians made that lesbians do not usually have children and that lesbianism and motherhood could plausibly, um, could, well, lesbianism could plausibly defi be defined to exclude motherhood. These debates also alienated lesbian mothers in a community that many had initially viewed as a safer space to raise children than the heterosexual family. Like much of American society, the lesbian community of the 1970s did not provide much practical support for mothers, despite a stated commitment to, quote, all women and to, quote, women's values. Lesbian mothers and their defenders routinely complained that event planners uh, failed to provide daycare or provided inadequate daycare for children. In one of the many, many, many ongoing, continuing struggles over the Michigan Women's Music Festival's evolving daycare policies, an exasperated, exasperated defender of lesbian mothers commented, quote, from the flyer, it seems like your provisions of childcare in general fall short of the high caliber of the rest of the festival, appearing as little more than well-stocked playpens with the hopes that of, quote, other women, and then she writes in parentheses, quest, uh, the mothers, question mark, providing the creative energy to keep the children out of the hair of the rest of us. You do not leave the cooking arrangements or the sound system to chance, yet this is in essence what has happened to childcare. 
So basically, you planned everything else out, right, but apparently the children are just supposed to play with rocks and sticks and we're not really sure who's gonna supervise that. Heated debate continued for years over the presence, significance, and at times the very existence of male children. Lesbian mothers with sons were sometimes told by other lesbians to, quote, give up their children. As one mother anguished, anguishedly described, described with anguish, quote, when I first came up here, the first thing that was thrown at me was that I should get rid of my son. It was really hard for a lot of us because we were on the border and didn't know what to do about separatism. I felt that I was a separatist on some levels, but that I couldn't get, get behind giving away my son. The debate over women's only space unleashed a torrent of hostility towards male children. One woman writing to the Lesbian Connection about a musical event stated, quote, boys are privileged everywhere else. Why can't I have a place free of their pollution? At the East Coast Lesbian Festival held in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, organizers failed to mention that boy children were not welcome. When one couple brought their 18-month-old son, who was still nursing, they were, quote, verbally harassed and confronted with signs on their tent saying, quote, baby prick, go home, and don't feed males, don't breed males, unquote. Some of the hostility that can be attributed to, uh, some of this hostility towards male children and children in general can be attributed to the relative youth of the women involved in the movement who saw their current childless lifestyle as representative of broader community values. So lesbian community is relatively young in the early 1970s, and a lot of people in it are young, they don't have kids, they don't see why they should have to deal. And they don't define lesbianism as having any real relationship to motherhood. These attitudes also demonstrated a more general American sense that children and parenting are private rather than public responsibilities, and that the community need not provide any real support to children or their parents. However, feminism sought to challenge just these divisions between public and private in other areas of life, something that defenders of lesbian mothers consistently pointed out. Furthermore, many lesbian feminists claimed to, quote, honor motherhood in the abstract and more generally wanted to reclaim these allegedly female values like nurturing. However, they often did so in direct opposition to motherhood, which they saw as taking energy away from the construction of a viable lesbian community. As one Berkeley woman wrote in dismay about the lesbian baby boom of the early 1980s, quote, going to have a baby? Other lesbians in the community have a right to know why. Why not put that amount of energy into other lesbians who need love, attention, support, and nurturance, as well as basic things like food and shelter, unquote. Why have your own baby when you can adopt an adult lesbian? <laughs> Like the courts, this woman saw lesbian motherhood as selfish, although her reasons differed significantly. Lesbian motherhood focused valuable energy and resources inward towards a privatized family, in her vision, rather than outwards towards an embattled community. Lesbian separatist desire for community without men or touched by their influence was clearly at the root of the hostility towards male children. Um, on the surface, however, it doesn't really explain the hostility towards lesbian motherhood more generally. And so one of the things I was struck by was, yeah, okay, so they don't like male children, but they really don't seem to like kids at all, and they don't want them around. And I argue that a desire for purity lay at the root of the broader objection to lesbian mothers in the 1970s. Lesbian separatism, like most of the separatist movements of the 1970s, was utopian, and as such was interested in preserving the purity of the movement. Boy children obviously are a problem in this light, but the existence of any children at all indicated that women in now living in, in the community as lesbians had had past sexual experience with men. Children of either sex were living bodily proof that lesbians had, had been heterosexual or had heterosexual contact in the past, something that many separatists wished to either efface or to forget. At the same time that lesbians debated the issue of what to do with real mothers, Greta, uh, as historian Greta Rensenbrink has argued, many also fantasized about parthenogenesis as a way of imagining reproduction free of men and also imagining the purity and strength of lesbian bodies. So parthenogenesis sort of became the holy grail to a certain extent of reproduction in the lesbian community, the idea that women could somehow literally not only reproduce without men but always produce girls. Um, and it became sort of an expression of how pure their bodies were that they would be able to do this. Thus, in the 1970s, at least, lesbian mothers faced considerable obstacles to parenting from both a hostile state and an ambivalent community. Motherhood and lesbianism were seen as mutually exclusive categories by both the courts and members of the lesbian community. The state used parental rights as a club to discourage lesbianism and to punish women who dared claim that identity. Even with a history of varied family formation in the U.S., so 
U.S. families have taken many forms over time, and at a time of great fluidity in family relations in the 1970s. So families are changing very quickly in their structure in the 1970s. Family courts saw their role as defending a particular definition of families that required male leadership. Courts resisted the formation of families outside of that model, and when families continued to emerge that violated that model, the courts punished them by withholding men's income. While some lesbians defended the rights of lesbian mothers to inclusion in the community, the very existence of the debate at a time when lesbian mothers routinely lost custody of their children indicates a real ambivalence on the part of the community over the ability of women to combine identities as lesbian and, and as mothers. Many in the lesbian community encourage mothers to expend their nurturing energy not on children, but on the broader project of creating and sustaining a lesbian community. It was not until the emergence of the lesbian baby boom that the debates within the community gradually re resolved. Deploying a language of reproductive freedom, defenders of lesbian mothers and lesbian mothers-to-be attacked the construction of lesbianism, uh, of lesbian as one that excluded mothers and argued instead for the right of lesbians to choose motherhood and to combine it with relationships with other women. I made it in time. Thank you very much. So Professor Clements's presentation really um, explores the links between how we inform our understanding of what's legitimate, what gets reinforced by the state as a legitimate choice, as a legitimate family, as perhaps even a legitimate identity, particularly when we speak of motherhood and how central that is on an individual and personal level, um, both to a family and to a community. So thank you very much. Um, we'll have question time at the end, so I'm going to simply move into the next speaker, who is Shannon Price, mentor. Shannon is the legal director of the National Center for Lesbian Rights, one of the nation's leading advocacy organizations for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. Shannon was lead counsel for the same-sex couples in the landmark California marriage equality case, which held that same-sex couples have the fundamental right to marry, and that laws that discriminate based on sexual orientation are inherently discriminatory and subject to the highest level of constitutional scrutiny. In, 19, um, in, sorry, in 2009, Shannon was named the California Lawyer of the Year by the California Lawyer. In 2008, he was among six lawyers of the year named by USA and among California's top 100 lawyers by the legal publication The Daily Journal. He also received the 2008 Dan Bradley Award from the National Gay and Lesbian Bar Association for Outstanding Work in Marriage Cases and was the recipient of the Cornell Law School Exemplary Public Service Award in 2005. Um, Shannon in 2005 was also one of 18 people to receive the Ford Foundation's Leadership for Changing World Award and an honorary degree from the City University of New York Law School for his advocacy on behalf of same-sex couples. Shannon currently serves on the American Bar Association's Commission on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity. He also serves on the boards of Equality California and the Transgender Law and Policy Institute. He received his JD from Cornell Law School in 1993, and he's originally from Texas and has a lovely accent. So um, this is Shannon. so much that was so interesting um, especially since uh, the place I work National Center for Lesbian Rights started out the reason it was founded in the late 70s was to provide representation to lesbian mothers so I, that was really fascinating so I'm just going to talk a little bit about a uh, very little bit about some of the basic constitutional issues in the marriage cases in order though to get at um, the challenge of trying to describe the harms caused by marriage bans the social and psychological harms uh, and, which is very difficult. Um, so, and forgive me, this is going to be very, very basic, but so the Constitution, federal and state constitutions, uh, limit what the government can do. They limit what the state can do to individuals and groups. So, you know, they, but they apply to government action. That includes laws. So every law that's passed at any level has to comply with all the provisions of the Constitution. Uh, for example, in, in the Lawrence case, Lawrence v. Texas, uh, the Supreme Court it struck down this Texas statute that made it a crime for gay people to engage in certain kinds of sexual conduct uh, while permitting heterosexual people to engage in that very same conduct without any kind of criminal prohibition. So the majority decision in Lawrence held that 
that statute violated the right to privacy. It's actually the first decision, it was really quite a big deal. You know, it was the first decision to hold that unmarried people, including lesbian gay people, actually have a fundamental constitutional right to engage in intimate sexual conduct with the person of their own choosing. Um, that whole privacy doctrine is based on the idea that there are certain decisions that are just so fundamental to personhood that uh, have such a huge effect on the course of a person's life and that also so deeply reflect a person's uh, values and beliefs that it would just be offensive to our notions of dignity and personhood to have the state dictating that. So that's the basis for the right uh, for uh, people married or unmarried to use contraception, uh, for women to decide whether or not to carry a child to term. It's also the basis for the right to marry and the right to parent. You know, the court has said, hey, these decisions are just so, so personal, so momentous for individuals. It has to be up to the individual. The state can't dictate what you do about that. Uh, there was a concurring opinion in Lawrence by Justice O'Connor, who's uh, no longer on the court. She's like, you know, we didn't really have to go that far. We didn't have to decide there's this fundamental right for unmarried people to have sex with whoever they want. That makes me kind of nervous. I think we should have just said uh, this statute violates equal protection. It's just fundamentally unfair to say gay people can't do this, but straight people can. There's no good reason for that. Well, those are also those two claims, privacy and equal protection, are also the basis for challenging marriage bans because, you know, as I noted, it is a sta it's been established for a long time that the right to marry is part of the right to privacy. It's one of those decisions that the individual, not the state, should get to make. And then the equality, the equal protection claim is obvious. You know, it's just can, can the state treat these two groups of people differently? Um, so the title, I think, of this, this section is State Toleration of Violence and Discrimination. And we talked a little bit, uh, Professor Rosario, I talked a little bit about um, yesterday about one of the ways the state tolerates discrimination and violence against uh, LGBT people is sort of by not passing laws, by not prohibiting discrimination in employment or hate crimes or what have you. But what is unusual, really very unusual in this day and age about marriage bans is that they actually affirmatively single out a particular name group of people and mandate as an affirmative policy that the state has to discriminate against, against that particular group. You don't really see laws too much like that anymore. Of course, historically they were they were quite common, but in this day and age, no. Uh, that's a uh, it's just really unusual. So part of the challenge in uh, litigation or even like in a political campaign is to try and describe well why is that harmful? What is the harm caused by a marriage ban? And you know, one way to do it obviously is you can talk about the deprivation of all the material rights and benefits and protections that go with marriage. But that is not uh, adequate for three reasons. One is that there's all kind of polling data now that shows that, that that message does not resonate with most people. Most people do not think about marriage in terms of rights and benefits. I'm talking about heterosexual people who have long had the right to marry. People do not generally marry in order to get particular benefits. Sometimes they do, of course. For some people, that's very important in particular circumstances. But as a general rule, most people like marry someone because I, I love this person, I want to marry them, it has personal or social or spiritual significance to them. The, the second reason is talking about rights and benefits doesn't really get at the heart of the sort of stigmatic or sometimes called dignitary harm caused by marriage bans, which is very important. And so if you're only talking about the material benefits, you're kind of ignoring and erasing this whole other dimension of what's going on. And then third, on a very pragmatic level, uh, you know, in the California marriage case and in the Prop 8 campaign, um, and now in the federal ch uh, court challenge to Proposition 8, same-sex couples in California already have all of the material rights and benefits that go with marriage. Those are provided through California's comprehensive domestic partnerships uh, statute. So you can't, you know, that's off the table. So all we're talking about in those cases is the harm caused, the social and psychological stigmatic dignitary harm caused by not having access to the status of marriage itself, to the institution of marriage, to being placed by law in a different separate category. So that is, it's very challenging to get beyond that kind of abstract generalities and be like, well, okay, what does that mean? You know, flesh that out. What does that mean in practice? 
And I think one of the ideas that has uh, been keep, keep coming up in our discussions of uh, this marriage issue through the conference is this notion that the harm caused by marriage bans is not really so much caused by the deprivation of marriage itself as by the deprivation of the freedom to choose whether to marry and who you want to marry. And I wanted to talk to you guys about something that the plaintiffs did in the uh, Perry trial that I think really uh, can deepen our understanding of, okay, what does that mean exactly? So one of the way the plaintiffs in Perry, which is the federal court challenge to Prop 8, tried to get at or explain to the court and everybody else this notion of stigmatic or dignitary harm is put on testimony by Dr. Elon Meyer, and I know some of you uh, know him and have worked with him, and he talked about the concept of minority stress. It's basically any kind of stress that's caused by or associated by or connected to stigma, prejudice, discrimination. One of the basic concepts behind this notion of minority stress is that the impact of a stressful event is not actually caused by the objective character of the event itself, but by the social meaning of the event. And it's really easy to illustrate this because if you think about if you, uh, for example, if you lose a job, okay, that's going to be stressful to anyone. Losing your job, that's stressful. But if you lose your job, if you're fired because of discrimination based on who you are, based on a personal characteristic like race or religion or sexual orientation, that has a much greater negative impact on a person. Or if you're a victim of a violent crime, yeah, that is stressful. But if you're singled out for victimization, in a hate crime, again, because of something about who you are, that has a much more negative impact on a person. It increases the magnitude of the stress like exponentially. And so one of the interesting uh, ramifications of this is that an event itself could be incredibly minor, just considered in terms of the objective nature of the event, but the impact, if it's, if it's in this minority stress model, could be, could be very serious. And Dr. Meyer gave the example of being treated in an unfriendly way by a partner's parents. You know, in itself, yeah, it's not, it's not a pleasant experience, but it shouldn't be that big a deal. But he said, but for a gay person, that may have or does have a very great social meaning of, again, echoing the rejection and disrespect they felt in the past and continue to feel in society. He also gave a really interesting example about the stress associated for same-sex couples, gay people with just filling out forms, you know, in everyday life. Anytime you have to fill out a form that requires you to identify your relationship status, it triggers this whole paradigm of minority stress. If you think about it in itself, like having to deal with a form that doesn't really, uh, uh, you know, doesn't fit who you are, or you maybe you have to alter the form a little bit, like what's the big deal? Like in itself, that doesn't seem like uh, that, it, such a, that it would have much of a negative impact. But he said, hey, for a gay person, when you're putting that experience, what they experience is there's no place for me to put anything there. So either they would say, well, I'm just going to say single, even though I've been in a relationship for the past 40 years because I just don't want to get into that. Or there might be, I think one of the plaintiffs mentioned crossing out things and writing in, thing, writing in things. But my point, obviously, this is not very demanding to cross out a form and say something else. And, if, and I would say if it was in any other context, nobody would remember that. Maybe the form wasn't very well written and you had to correct something. That would not be a memorable event. The only reason it's memorable is because, as I said, of what it means. And what it means is social rejections. It echoes the kinds of rejections that I've been describing earlier. And then Dr. Meyer also talked about, I just think this is like really fascinating. I'm sure some of you who work in this field are very familiar with it, but I'd never heard of it, of it before. This concept of a non-event. So paradoxically, a non-event can be very stressful, even though technically, like, nothing has happened. <laughs> so he explained that the way that works is if there's an expectation that something is supposed to happen, and then it doesn't happen. So for example, if you're working at a job and you're like really expecting hey, you know, I'm going to get a promotion or I'm going to get tenure or whatever, and then that doesn't happen. We'll say nothing happened, but it's extremely stressful. Um, so Dr. Meyer uh, testified about the fact that, you know, that in society there is a, an expectation that uh, when people grow up, uh, they are likely to get married. Uh, so, you know, in everyday, not, everyday life, somebody may be asked, happens all the time, 
are you married, why aren't you married, are you going to get married, those kind of questions. Um, and that is for, um, for non-gay people, you know, that can be annoying or upsetting, but it's not likely to be outside of a context that we could all probably think about. It's not likely to be hugely traumatizing. But when a gay person is asked that question, it has a far more significant impact because, they're in, because it triggers this whole structure of social stigma and devaluing of gay relationships. Because uh, if, a if a gay person has to explain, you know, you're asked, well, why aren't you married? Um, you have, as Dr. Meyer pointed out, um, by explaining why I'm not married, you have to explain I'm not seen as equal. My status is not respected by my state or my country or my fellow citizens. And he also talked about the way these concepts are internalized uh, in groups that are discriminated against and specifically in this case with gay people so that you go through daily life sort of anticipating this rejection and discrimination at every turn and you're just always kind of braced for it. And again, the point in any given situation, the anticipation itself is the stress. Something bad may or may not happen at any turn, but you're constantly having to maintain the vigilance of looking out for it and expecting that it may happen at any time. And then in order to avoid the discrimination and stigma, people often conceal their sexual orientation. And he testified very powerfully about how stressful that is that just the sheer level of cognitive work involved in remembering to change pronouns or remembering what you've told to who. He said it's actually uh, described in studies by people who conceal various things as a kind of hell, that it has an actually incredibly detrimental impact on people's lives. And then another concept that I had not been familiar with but I think is, is so powerful and kind of connects back to the constitutional doctrine of the right to privacy is this notion of a possible self and Dr. Meyer uh, testified that, or explained to the court that, um, you know, people not only think about, uh, you know, what they're doing in the present, but that all of us have implicitly some kind of proje future projection of just the range of options open to you in your life, like who you possibly could become as you get older or grow up or, um, um, you know, living, living your life, and that one of the harms caused by marriage bans, and not just marriage bans, but the whole structure of stigma and devaluing of same-sex relationships is that gay people, and particularly growing up, have a very constricted sense of what is, what's the possible self, you know, unfolding in front of you. And he suggested that um, studies have shown that uh, gay, gay and lesbian youth had a harder time projecting the future because they've internalized these negative attitudes in the sense that the range of possibilities open to them are very limited. So the, where this takes me is I hope that this, these concepts help to show that the point of challenging marriage bans is really not either that people do now or will in the future have to marry in order to be respected socially, but rather that gay people, like everyone else, would just have the choice, would have the same freedom to marry as other people, and that this entire structure, sort of officially imposed stigma, would be removed. So the point is not to that everyone has to get married, you know, in order to be uh, socially respectable, but that we need to get rid of just the enormous stigma that's imposed by being in this officially designated class of people whose relationships are so devalued and considered so inferior to other people's that they're denied this. What's for everyone else, this fundamental privacy right of being able to decide whether to marry and who you want to marry. So I just wanted to, to clarify, because this has come up a number of times, that when we're talking about the concept of dignity and equal citizenship and that the, the right to marry is at the foundation of dignity and equal citizenship, that is not because the, the status of being married itself is somehow the source of the dignity, that if you're not married, you're, you're not partaking of the dignity associated with marriage, but rather that it's the, it's the choice itself. The same way that um, the court has held that it would deny women uh, dignity and equal citizenship for the state to dictate whether a woman is going to give birth to a child or have an abortion. 
It's not that the dignity is derived from either one of those things, from giving birth or having an abortion, but that it would be such an affront to personal dignity for the, for the state to take away that choice from a woman. So it's the same kind of concept here with the fundamental right to marry and with gay people. So I just want to close with reinforcing a point that uh, Lisa Dugan made yesterday, is that we need to be very careful when we're talking about this and explaining these concepts of dignity and personhood and equal citizenship that we're very clear about the framework and that we're not conflating uh, the dignity inherent in being able to make such an important choice for oneself and not having that dictated by the state as opposed to somehow idealizing the status of being married itself. So I'll stop there and look forward to uh, questions and comments later. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing um, some new learning on what could potentially anchor um, a heightened level of scrutiny on these kinds of questions. Um, earlier this morning, I acknowledged my appreciation for um, my class that is actually attending this. And we've been working in these last several weeks on concepts and notions of equality. Um, what does it mean? Um, and your remarks, I think, were really quite insightful and helpful for us because one of the struggles about equality is, is it something that we're looking for that has to be the same? And what I'm hearing from you is not that you're looking necessarily for the same given the legislative situation in California, you're looking for respect, as I understand it. Um, so I look forward to a Q&A to tease out how, that, um, how the state is implicated in that um, and how private actors are as well. Um, turning to our next speaker, Professor Clif Clifford Roski is an associate professor of law at the University of Utah's S.J. Quinney College of Law. Before joining the faculty, he served as a research fellow for the Williams Institute on Sexual Orientation, Law, and Public Policy at the UCLA School of Law. While at the Williams Institute, he co-authored over 30 demographic reports on lesbian, gay, and bisexual populations in the United States and developed teaching materials and judicial training courses on sexual orientation in the law. Professor Roski received his JD from Yale Law School, where he served as co-editor-in-chief of the Yale, jo of Yale Journal of Law and Humanities, and was a postgraduate research fellow. He teaches courses on criminal law, civil rights, and sexuality, gender, and the law here. And his research on LGBT parenthood has been published in the Yale Journal of Law and Feminism. He has also recently been elected a board of director member for Equality Utah. So, Professor Roski. Thank you. So um, I'm playing a somewhat odd role here today because I'm an academic, but I'm here as an activist and as a local community member on this panel. Uh, in particular, I'm here as a member of Equality Utah's Board of Directors. Uh, and for those who don't know, Equality Utah is an organization that works to secure basic equal rights, actually full equal rights, for gay and transgender Utahns and their families. So I've been asked to join the panel to talk about some of the work that I've done for Equality Utah and that Equality Utah has done for the community to give us a concrete example of how Utahns are working to change government policies on sexuality and gender. And specifically, I've been asked to tell the story of a statewide campaign known as Common Ground. So like so many good stories, the story of Common Ground starts not in Utah but in California. So in 2008, it starts specifically uh, with the uh, LDS Church's involvement in the campaign to pass Proposition 8, which was the California State Constitutional Amendment um, to prohibit gay couples from marrying, to define marriage as between one man and one woman. So in the summer of 2008, the church made a public announcement that it was going to join a coalition of churches to support the passage of Prop 8. The church called on its members to invest their time and their money to support this campaign. As the campaign proceeded, the church clarified its position in a series of public statements saying that although it was opposed to gay couples marrying, it was not opposed to other basic rights that had already been established in California and in particular, they named health care, uh, employment, housing, and inheritance rights. 
in November of that year, when Prop 8 passed, a lot of people got very angry. And uh, some people blamed the LDS Church and the Catholic Church, among other groups. People protested. They called each other names. And some people even called for boycotts of the Church of Utah and of Sundance and of businesses owned by people who had supported Prop 8. Now, at Equality Utah, we don't have the luxury of boycotting Utah. right? That's not in our mission statement for obvious reasons. And it is what it is. We understand at Equality Utah that the LDS Church is one of the most powerful political organizations in our neighborhood. So we decided that instead of working against the church, we would try to work with the church on these issues. After all, we had recently learned, thanks to the Prop 8 campaign, that the church was not opposed to a list of basic protections for LGBT Utahns, uh, and that none of those protections currently existed in our state. So based on those statements made by the church, we drafted a package of legislative proposals, of bills, that we labeled at the time the Common Ground Initiative. And then we submitted to the Utah legislature early in 2009. Putting aside the details, the, our basic proposals were fairly straightforward. We had a, a bill that said that you wouldn't be able to be fired or kicked out of your house because you're gay or transgender a law saying that you could designate someone to be included on your health insurance, even if you weren't married, and a law saying that you could designate someone to make medical decisions for you and to inherit from you, even if you weren't married and even if you hadn't filled out a will. So that was the Common Ground Initiative in a nutshell. We briefly considered including a constitutional amendment in Utah. Utah already has a constitutional amendment which says marriage is defined as between one man and one woman, but it also says that no other relationships that are like marriage will be recognized. So that prohibits things like civil unions and domestic partnerships. We initially had a proposal to amend that second part of that constitutional amendment to allow for something like domestic partnerships. But we realized that we don't have support for domestic partnership in Utah uh, yet. And so we withdrew that proposal to focus on common ground. So before I continue, I want to clarify a few um, basic misconceptions that were floating around in the debates about these proposals. And you may well have heard them about any debates about anti-discrimination laws. The first thing is that these proposals do not establish special rights. There's nothing special about the right to earn a living or to keep a roof over your head. These are rights that many of us take for granted either because we already have them or because we don't need them. And on a related note, these proposals don't establish a new protected class or grant special protections to gay and transgender Utahns. They give the same protections to all Utahns. That is, under these laws, you can't be fired because you're heterosexual, you can't be fired because you're gay, and you can't be fired because you're transgender. So last year, unfortunately, the legislature rejected all of the common ground proposals. But contrary to popular wisdom, that setback was not the demise of the campaign for common ground. On the contrary, recently in particular, it's become increasingly clear that common ground is more than just a cute little catchphrase. Last spring, a series of polls conducted by the Deseret News, the Salt Lake Tribune, and KSL News confirmed that our health care, employment, and housing and inheritance proposals are actually supported by a significant majority of Utahns. Actually, I still remember walking into work this day. Somebody picks up a copy of the Tribune to show to me the results of these polls and the headline in particular, and there it was above the fold, Salt Lake Tribune headline, Utahns back gay rights. And I actually had to do a double take that it was January, not April, right? Because I, 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 it seemed like a practical joke um, that it happened that fast. And then, really though, more recently we've learned that it's not just a matter of common ground being the results that we see in public opinion polls. Three months ago, the Salt Lake City Council unanimously adopted ordinances that protect LGBT Utahns, and indeed all Utahns, against discrimination in employment and housing. At the hearing for these ordinances, 
the LDS Church made an official public statement in support of them. And I'm going to quote from the, the statement. It, I, I also remember this vividly. I was there. I was asked to speak in support of the ordinances at the, very much at the last minute. I start writing down my talking points. I'm ready to go. And the first speaker is an official representative of the church. And you can, you'll be able to hear how all of my talking points were hit in the church's statement, although certainly there were other talking points that I wouldn't put in there. Um, so the issue before you tonight is the right of people to have a roof over their heads and the right to work without being discriminated against. That's the church speaking about the ordinances. In drafting this ordinance, the city has granted common sense rights that should be available to everyone while safeguarding the crucial rights of religious organizations. So that was, I was like, whoa, okay, don't have to say that, don't have to say that. And then there was another statement, the church supports this ordinance because it is fair and reasonable, right, and does not do violence to the institution of marriage. That's not the way I would have put the point, but certainly I was ready to make the distinction that employment is one thing and marriage is another. In the wake of that statement, another Deseret News poll found that 69% of Utahns, including 67% of Mormons, and 61% of Republicans support Salt Lake City's new employment and housing laws. And last month, Salt Lake County adopted similar ordinances by another unanimous vote. And at this very moment, cities and counties across Utah are consim considering similar measures. So now we come to the most recent chapter in this uh, development. In light of this progress, many people had high hopes for the legislative session this year. After the church's public statement, none other than Senator Chris Butters announced his support for a statewide version of Salt Lake City's ordinances. This is a pretty remarkable turnaround. <laughs> Just last year, Senator Butters had called gay people, and this is a quote, the greatest threat to America going down, whatever that means. As I'm sure many of you have heard, however, the legislature is not going to pass a statewide employment and housing law this year. In fact, they're not going to consider passing any of our proposals at all. As the session began this year, we learned some disappointing news from our friends in the legislature. Although the majority of Utahns support statewide employment and housing laws, a majority of the Utah legislature was against it. To make matters worse, the legislature was actually prepared to pass a law that would repeal the ordinances passed by unanimous votes in Salt Lake City and Salt Lake County and ban other cities and counties across Utah from passing similar measures. This was no idle threat. The language was drafted and the votes had been pledged. And oh, I know we have this a con law, uh, a constitutional law class in the background, so the question for you is, would that be constitutional? How would they try to go about doing that? So interestingly, though, they were ready to do it, but they were also a little skittish about it, and they wanted to talk, or at least they were willing to talk. And so after a few meetings, we reached an agreement. For the moment, both sides would back off. They agreed not to, peel, not to repeal the existing ordinances, and we agreed not to push any of our new bills to a vote. Now, in terms of our principles, I think it's safe to say that this agreement made all of us ill. Right? Uh, we're not waiting for equality, we're working for equality. That's what we want to do. But in terms of our tactics, we were actually quite pleased with this result. The agreement allowed us to continue working with cities and counties across Utah and to build a statewide movement in support of an employment and housing law. In the days that followed, though, some members of the LGBT community voiced very strong objections to this agreement in both practical and principled terms. Some thought that the threat was a bluff and we should have called it. Some thought that we should have raised our voices and gone down swinging. Some thought that we should be fighting for full equality, including marriage rights, now, instead of focusing on basic rights like employment and housing. There were op-eds and emails, meetings and calls, accusations and apologies. By all accounts, though, these conversations were fruitful, and if nothing else, they certainly multiplied. 
Above all in this process, Equality Utah has come to appreciate that when we sit down to talk with our friends in state and county and city governments, we are working on behalf of a wonderfully diverse and vibrant community. A community that includes a, a broad array of organizations and individuals with a broad array of views and goals. Do we contradict ourselves? Yes, we contradict ourselves. We are large, we contain multitudes. <laughs> Doing that kind of work is both a responsibility and a privilege, and frankly, we're still getting used to it. But to quote Lisa Dugan's talk from yesterday, we are busy building in mechanisms of accountability into our process to make sure that as we move forward, all of our interests will be represented and all of our voices will be heard. So I want to close now by switching my hat and becoming an academic again and taking a step back from this work and considering some of the broader theoretical implications of the work. Last summer, Lisa Dugan wrote a lovely article in The Nation called What's Right with Utah? And in this article, uh, she praised the diversity and energy of our queer community and the, what she called the creative and constructive response to the church's involvement in the passage of Prop 8. If you were able to hear Lisa's talk yesterday, you may be able to guess what she likes about the Common Ground campaign. By focusing on securing basic rights for all Utahns, we've been able to broaden the scope of our movement beyond marriage and beyond relationships to protect a wider range of people and benefits than marriage does. In addition, of course, we've positioned ourselves in the center, which is no mean feat in one of the country's most conservative states. With the people and the church behind us, our most vocal opponents are increasingly looking marginalized. And I think that in the coming years, we expect to capture more and more of the movable middle and make tangible, significant steps toward full equality under our laws. I do think, however, that critical theory has generated a set of tough tactical questions that can be asked about this style of politics, and even about the concrete goal of passing something that seems so unabashedly good as an, a state anti-discrimination law on employment. As Lisa showed us yesterday, we must always be cautious when adopting a liberal framework and choosing our objectives from the traditional menu of liberal legal reforms. If critical theory has taught us anything about law, it's that claims that are based on rights and identities are always perilous because they're always embedded and implicated in a larger system of inequality that is sanctified and structured by laws. So let's take employment discrimination laws, for example. To win a claim under such a law, what do you have to do? Well, first you have to hire a lawyer, and lawyers are expensive. And this is gonna be difficult because you just got fired from your job. So you're out of work and you've got bills to pay and plenty of pressing things to worry about. And if you could find a lawyer, then you'd still have an uphill battle because you'd have to prove that your employer fired you because you are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. That's gonna be difficult too because very few employers are dumb enough to actually provide illegal reasons for firing you. In light of these kinds of legal obstacles, it's not surprising that employment laws are no panacea. Our country still has massive wealth and income disparities based on race and sex, almost 50 years after the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. To add insult to injury, once these laws are passed, they're often invoked to justify the same disparities they were intended to eliminate. If you have the right to work, the logic goes, well then problems like homelessness and unemployment and the lack of access to health care, that's your fault go get a job. Finally, there's some tricky political pitfalls with campaigning for employment discrimination laws. For obvious reasons, these campaigns often focus on the singular injustice of being fired just because you're gay, just because you're transgender. While that rhetoric is very effective at reaching the movable middle, it presents a very narrow and privileged view of who we are that is, if you're being fired just for being gay, then you must be white and wealthy, male, young, and able. That is, you must be someone who's not subject to other forms of discrimination based on race, class, sex, age, or disability, among other things. 
I think there's more to say here, but the question is, is there anything left after you said it? I think so. I think there's quite a bit left. Even after we take law down a peg, I think there's still both principled and pragmatic reasons to work for equal rights, including employment discrimination laws. The principle seems pretty clear. We, we work for the right to work because we want it and because we deserve it. When this principle is codified in our laws, it's not magically realized or implemented or rolled out. Law just becomes one more source to turn to for political, social and cultural authority for the principle that people should be treated equally. At the margins, hopefully, it may become a little harder for employers to discriminate, a little easier for employees to come out. And in this respect, there was some evidence discussed yesterday about correlations between employment laws and good outcomes for um, gay and lesbian people. And while there are serious causal questions to ask about that. Um, even if the causal situation were reversed, that is, um, positive attitudes towards gay and lesbian people lead to the passage of anti-discrimination laws, those laws can then support that very social pattern and they can you know, engage in a kind of reflexive relationship and support each other. The practical advantages may be a bit subtler and they're not across the board, but they're no less important. French philosopher Michel Foucault tells us that our, in, when we try to resist a system of power, we must use law as just another tactic rather than an end in, in itself. Yet in tactical terms, there's nothing quite like a campaign for a universal basic human right to mobilize and organize our supporters. By focusing on employment, and ironically, by focusing on the city and county level, we can actually push our movement beyond Salt Lake City and beyond Salt Lake County for the first time and organize across the state of Utah. We can build a bona fide statewide movement. We can take back our legislature and we can govern ourselves. Thanks. Um, thank you very much. So we'll open for questions in just a bit. Um, but I wanted to reflect on the aims and impacts of this panel to really explore different forms of state policy regarding sexuality and sexual minorities and laws regarding same-sex marriage and laws regarding same-sex parenting to initiatives aimed at promoting the equal and human rights of same-sex um, couples or sexual minorities. Um, and within that, we've seen a number of different strategies. I mean, Shannon really spoke from the perspective of a litigator who spends his time in courts trying to adjudicate rights and work them into existence, whereas Cliff's work um, as an advocate as opposed to an academic has been largely in the space of legislative initiatives and public campaigns. Um, so it's interesting to have both of you here to maybe perhaps talk about that interaction. And Beth, to reflect on over the broader course of history how social movements um, and constructions of constitutional law maybe inform interpretations of our law um, because the law li exists in our legal imagination as well as in our courts. Um, so with that, I was first going to invite the panel to perhaps pose questions to one another before opening up to the audience, um, if you have anything, because... Okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd All right, so we'll go, um, <laughs> fine, to the audience. Um, yes, I see Professor Kogan has a question. as multiracial. Uh, and the question becomes, should the government at all
be asking people, what sex are you? Are you married? What race are you? If they do, should they leave a blank there for you to fill in what you want to fill in? Or should they give you more choices? Or what is your attitude towards this? No, that, that's a really uh, interesting point. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the specific harms caused by laws that classify based on sexual orientation, and again, that is extremely unusual in our legal system. It is at this point almost unheard of for a law to apply only to a particular racial group, only to a particular gender, only to a particular religion, only to people from of a particular national origin. That is so deeply offensive to our basic constitutional provisions and requirements now that um, just the very idea of it is deemed to be inherently suspect under uh, you know basic equal protection theory. So it's you know it's important to remember that that is the, that's the context in which we're looking at marriage bans or any laws that single out gay people as a named identified group and said and say that you and only you everybody in this category of persons is subject to different treatment is denied a particular right in in, in this case uh, marriage um, part of what that does is suggest that sexual orientation is uh, a real category that it is a legitimate basis for uh, differential treatment and that you know which poses, as you're suggesting, this larger question of is it appropriate for the state to be um, imposing those sorts of categories? You know, what do we suppose that's based on? Some sort of objective reality that people, you know, naturally or objectively fall into different categories based on their sexual orientation and that somehow, therefore, it's appropriate for the state to treat them differently on that basis? No. I mean, part of what is so uh, damaging about that type of a law is that it signals it is the state and in like California and Utah both with having state constitutional amendments you know as a as a basic fundamental constitutional principle the state is saying that it is okay to treat persons differently because of their sexual orientation so no I think that the same way that we now at least with respect to race and religion the 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 governing framework is pretty much that the state has uh, renounced any ability or authority to classify people in any way based on on their race or religion, except for basic kind of statistical data data keeping purposes. But uh, this, you know, the state there is no circumstance now in which the state purports to identify a person's race, for example, and the. U.S. Supreme Court case law on race now acknowledges that race is a social convention, that there is no objective scientific definition of race. So, yeah, sexual orientation is in more or less a unique category now where the state still is, you know, taking the position that, hey, I, you know, I, the state, know what sexual orientation is and um, incorporating that classification in laws and even in the state constitution and it is okay to treat people differently on that basis. Gender is a more complex. The state still also does identify people based on gender. So some people have argued that we should disestablish gender the same way we've disestablished religion, which means the state should not be able to classify people based on their uh, gender either. Yeah, that's a big question, and I would be curious if other people have thoughts on that. <laughs> right. Other questions? Yes. 